is uh, a um, uh, consideration of the Mid Coast Local Coastal Program uh, update project. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, several items uh, that uh, today, this is a one in a series of hearings, the first in a series of hearings. Let me um, outline for the public uh, how we will be approaching the hearing. The, um, we're going to um, momentarily get a report uh, from uh, the uh, county planning staff. Um, following that, uh, we will open the public hearing. Um, the uh, public testimony will be taken. Everyone will be allowed uh, up to two minutes uh, per person. There will not be an opportunity for somebody to waive their time for someone else. Um, the, um, at the conclusion of the public hearing, uh, the board will then consider each of the items uh, that um, uh, are on the task list for today, the key issues, and will make a tentative uh, decision um, on each of those issues. Uh, and. Um, uh, with the understanding that uh, when we get to the uh, the final uh, step of this process, we will go back uh, and uh, pull together those tentative decisions uh, into a final uh, conclusion on the part of the board. Um, I also want to say that um, uh, momentarily when we uh, do open the public hearing, um, at that point, if anyone wants to speak, you'll need to have your speaker slip in. Um, uh, at the point we open the public hearing, if you do not have your speaker slip in, uh, then you will not be able to speak. So if you want to speak, you need to get it in now. Um, they can be placed uh, in the, uh, the box here or given to the clerk. The, um, uh, having said that, uh, we'll uh, uh, ask uh, Marcia Raines, our Director of Environmental Services, to, uh, to introduce this item. Thank you, President Gordon. Uh, two points I wanted to make. The first was that on your January 25th uh, board item, you requested a more comprehensive outreach program to occur regarding the details of these meetings. You suggested at that time as a Board of Supervisors entirely that we meet with a subcommittee which consisted of you and Supervisor Hill to discuss how to enhance noticing procedures. I'd like to inform you that we did meet, and as you're fully aware, we identified four ways to enhance the advertising. The first is the half-page ad that was placed in the Half Moon Bay Review. A copy of that ad is on the screen. Second, we identified a way to uh, continue the regular noticing that was uh, customarily provided, and as such, the San Mateo County Times had a notice of this hearing. Third. We talked about mailing notice to each of the participants in former meetings that had expressed an interest in being on our ever-growing project mailing list. At this time, that represents about 300 people, and we did mail out 300 notices. The fourth approach that was suggested was that we, in addition to our, out, our customary items, that we would send a notice to property owners affected by a specific topic to be considered at any one hearing. For example, today you're going to consider lot merger proposals. As such, we sent meeting notices to all property owners whose parcels are candidates for lot merger. In other words, we did a focused mailing to owners of residentially zoned vacant parcels with substandard lots and common ownerships. Likewise, for future hearings, we will do focused mailings, such as owners of undeveloped non-conforming parcels would, that would be affected by the proportionality rule would receive notice owners of C1 zone parcels where residential use is proposed to be limited to above the first floor would receive a notice, et cetera. The second item that I'd like to talk to you about is when you met in January, you discussed a schedule of four hearings. The final of those hearings was planned for April 12th. We've taken a serious look at the items that will be required to prepare your packet and your information, and it is our recommendation at that this time that the April 12th meeting be moved further out to April 26th in order to provide adequate time for staff to synthesize all the information and decisions you make and bring back to a complete package. With those two additions, I'd like to hand it over to George Bergman from the planning staff to make a brief presentation on all the issues that are before you today, and then as you suggested, he'll sit down and you can open it up to public public testimony. Great, thank you. Thank you, Marcia. George? Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, today's hearing focuses on the topics that are shown on the screen. These are Mid-Coast Residential Build-Out, Mid-Coast Infrastructure Demanded Build-Out, 
Midcoast traffic mitigation requirements, also the number of Midcoast residential non-conforming parcels, the proposal for merging Midcoast residential substandard lots, and uh, limits on impervious surface controls and winter grading. Before opening the meeting for uh, public testimony, I'd like to very briefly overview the topics that uh, uh, will be discussed today. And I'll begin with our updated estimate of Midcoast residential build-out. As I indicated at the uh, study session, the term build-out refers to that point when a community has been fully developed according to its, the planning policy of the jurisdiction. Uh, in other words, build-out is when is the planned endpoint in a community's growth. Uh, as shown on the screen, we've determined that there are uh, 3,719 existing residential units in the Midcoast uh, and that build-out would could be up to 7,153 units. As such, mid the Midcoast is just over 50% built out. The Planning Commission raised concerns about the unknown number of existing second units in the community, and um, these would be units that have not gone through the county's permitting process for second units. As such, the Planning Commission rec also recommends that your board direct staff to develop a program to identify these uh, yet to be permitted or sometimes called illegal second units uh, and then take measures to facilitate their legalization. Uh, next, I'm going to very briefly discuss infrastructure demand in the Midcoast. Uh, that is, how much water, sewer, and roadway capacity will be needed to serve the LCP build-out, the Midcoast build-out according to the LCP. Uh, first, we'll look at the Coastside County Water District, which serves Miramar, Princeton, and El Granada. Uh, when comparing the district's existing capacity with projected demand at build-out, we found that absent any improvements uh, or new water sources, there would be a 9% shortfall at build-out. I should note that these numbers assume annual average demand and not peak day demand, which typically occurs in the hot days of summer. In this regard, the Coastside County Water District reports that it has taken measures um, to respond to peak day demand, such as water storage impoundments for when there's an increased need. Uh, next, we took a look at the Montero Water and Sanitary District, which generally serves the area north of El Granada up to, uh, up to Montero and the urban rural boundary. Uh, when comparing the district's existing capacity with projected demand at build-out, we found that absent any improvements or new water sources, there would be a 46% shortfall at build-out. Uh, I, I would like to note that the district is actively looking for new water sources. There are limited resources in the area, but they are looking for uh, both uh, groundwater and uh, surface water sources. With regard to wastewater treatment, um, the local wastewater treatment service provider in the Midcoast is Sewer Authority Midcoast Side, or SAM, which operates its treatment facility serving the Midcoast, but the facility is in Half Moon Bay. Uh, we've determined the Midcoast demand, the Midcoast demand for wastewater treatment and build-out will be approximately 1.61 million gallons per day, while SAM's existing treatment capacity is 1.71 million, gall million gallons per day, and this represents a 6% treatment capacity surplus at build-out. I should note that there's a distinction between dry weather flow and wet weather flow, and as such, staff, ha excuse me, SAM has recently made major tank and pump station improvements to assure that this excess is not consumed by wet weather flow during the rainy season. Before moving on, I'd like to note that at the study session when we last met, Supervisor Church had requested that staff research the number and location of known individual wells in the Midcoast. And uh, in response, uh, we've done a little research and we've determined, principally from the first edition of the groundwater study report, that uh, 539 wells are definitely known to exist and have been mapped. And we've also determined that up to another additional 550 wells are believed to exist but not, cannot be mapped due, either to, uh, due to a number of factors, which include wells that may have been installed without permits or records uh, on wells that have incomplete uh, location information. I have with me maps that shows the distribution of the 500 known wells, and if you want, would like to see them, uh, please request so it, I can put them on. If not, I'll move on. Um, next, we're going to look at roadway capacity. Um, the relationship between roadway capacity and traffic volume is typically expressed as a level of service or LOS measure. In the left column on the screen, um, 
It is shown, what is shown is the 2001 LOS measure for the most congested highway segments. Um, and as you can see in all cases, uh, the current situation is level of service E, which is characterized by forced traffic flow and very slow, very low average speeds. The uh, projected 2001 levels are shown on the right column, and as can be seen, uh, not 2001, 2010, sorry. Uh, and as can be seen in 2010, the most congested roadway sections will be at service level F, except for the stretch of highway from El Granada to Montera, which will be at service level E. Service level F is when roadway demand exceeds capacity and is characterized by unstable stop and go conditions, often referred to as gridlock. Uh, at the study session when we last met, Supervisor Gordon was inquiring why PM peak was shown rather than AM peak. In response, we've did, uh, I've done some research and spoken with uh, our Mark Duino, our transportation planner, and uh, he's indicated that the uh, PM peak is considered the worst and most congested roadway condition because in addition to, because of in addition to commute traffic, there is much more non-commute traffic in the uh, PM than in AM, and this would be from afternoon shopping, business trips, school trips, and recreation trips. So the total picture is worse in the PM than in the AM, and that's the reason PM is shown the, um, when capacity is, sh uh, when discussing roadway capacity. Moving on, um, We'll next talk about traffic mitigation requirements. Currently, the Public Works Department collects road mitigation fees uh, from new development for local road and drainage improvements. Um, in addition, CCAG, the City County Association of Governments, San Mateo County, requires that we mitigate traffic impacts on primary roads, which is known as roads on the uh, CMP network, um, from new development that generates more than a hundred peak hour trips and mitigation can involve requiring fees or requiring what are known as transportation demand, demand measures or TDMs, which typically include establish, establishing an employee shuttle, um, van pooling program, subsidizing transit, charging for employee parking, or instituting a compressed work week, those type of measures. Uh, the planning, that's, th that's what's in place. The, Public Works collects road mitigation fees and CCAG requires uh, transportation demand measures for large projects that generate over 100 trips. The Planning Commission recommends that more be done to avert traffic congestion and proposes the traffic mitigation requires the requirements also be required for moderate sized new development. In particular, the Commission recommends that the county require TDMs for new development projects that generate less than 100 peak hour trips uh, but are large enough to not be exempt from CEQA, such as a single family dwelling is exempt from CEQA, so it would not be required of this. So we're talking about now projects that are not so small that they're exempt from CEQA, which would typically be hou uh, housing or small apartment house or very small business, but still uh, it's significant enough that it has, l it has less than 100 trip peak hour trips, but, um, but otherwise would be overlooked by the CCAG policy. And as such, moderate sized developments would be required to then would then be required to establish the, uh, techniques like carpooling or van pooling program, subsidizing transit, or a compressed work week, as I indicated. Next, I'm going to uh, discuss the number of nonconforming parcels. The term nonconforming parcel means any parcel whose area is less than the zoning and minim minimum parcel size, such as a 3,000 square foot parcel in a uh, zoning district with a minimum parcel size is 5,000 square feet. That 3,000 square foot parcel would be a non-conforming parcel, be it less than the 5,000 square foot requirement. Uh, non-conforming parcels are particularly prevalent in the mid-coast since this area was originally subdivided in the early 20th century into very small lots, which we call substandard lots. As shown on the screen, we've determined that there are approximately 4,900 residential zone substandard lots and about a third of these occur as vacant parcels, and about two-thirds occur as developed parcels. By focusing on vacant parcels, we see that there are approximately 1,600 undeveloped residential zone substandard lots in the mid-coast, and these lots are currently organized into different sized parcels, as shown in the sc on the screen. Um, 271 of the lots occur as a one-lot parcel, meaning that one owner only owns that lot and no land around it. Um, 944 of these lots are grouped into two lot parcels. That means there is that 
two very small lots are owned by one person who most likely intends to build a house on the two of them uh, in, at, at some point in the future. And then uh, correspondingly, 354 of the lots are grouped on three par lot parcels and 36 are grouped on four lot parcels. Um, at the study session, uh, Supervisor Tissier was inquiring as to the relative size distribution of substandard lots, particularly the very small lots. In response, we did uh, as much research as we could this week, uh, and we've determined that there are 163 residential zone lots that are smaller than 2,500 square feet. About half of these, they divide into two categories, about half of these are 50 of these, excuse me, 80 of these, 50 percent, about 80 of these lots are the original lots that were part of the subdivisions that occurred uh, near the turn of the last century, meaning these, the configuration of these lots haven't changed. When, they were, uh, when the major subdivisions occurred, these were at the corners near, uh, near streets, and they were much smaller um, just because of the pattern, the way the subdivision occurred. And we've ke looked at the size, and for this group, size ranges between 1,025, the smallest was 1,025 square feet, and the largest was 2497, just short of 2500. We were focusing on less than 2500 square foot lots. Now the other half, which would be 83 of the lots, these were lots that were reconfigured or reshaped after the original subdivision by any number of re uh, reasons. Um, they could be, we saw that some were cut off because Highway 1 came into existence. Uh, some were created because roads were abandoned and people just put lots in the middle, they created their lots, and then there were just different deed transfers that occurred and people created bits of property before we had zoning, uh, before we had zoning and planning departments. So for these 83 lots, the, um, the range is broader and it goes um, from 100 square feet to 2,400 square feet. So just to recap, for the, I think the area of concern were the very small lots, for the lots that were less than 2,500, approximately 163, half of them were products of the original subdivision, half came about from other reasons, and they range in size um, in the former category from about 1,000 to 2,400 um, square feet, and the other one getting down very, very small. Um, moving on to merger, I believe. Yes. This isn't changing. Um, well, we'll have to go without the graphic. One, one technique to reduce the number of substandard lots is to merge those um, that are contiguous and in common ownership, that is, owned by the same person. Without parcel merger, property owners could legally sell off the substandard lots, thereby creating building sites that have uh, not been planned for or counted in the projected build out. Uh, well, with using this this graphic that's on the screen, um, if we look at like the 944 lots that are grouped as two lot parcels right now, which would be the, sec the uh, second group of diamonds, the second diamond down, those are one owner owns two lots together. That typically you would expect the person to build a house on the two lots. It's a standard size par parcel in the typical sense. But there is uh, no control in place now that would prevent the owner from selling off those individual lots that, and then subsequent owners could come in and apply for two houses on what is envisioned and planned for to be one parcel. So merging is one way to, uh, through a mandatory government process, to um, combine the two lots into a single parcel without uh, relying on the owner voluntarily doing that. Um, the law, existing law allows the county to merge contiguous lots in common owner, ownership when at least one of the lots is undeveloped and at least one of the lots um, is less than 5,000 square feet in area. County council has advised that lots may be merged into parcels that are up to 5,000 square feet or the minimum parcel size for the zoning district. One strength of lot merger is that it implements the LCP's um, planned level of development and density However, a downside of this approach is that owners acting quickly could avoid merger by selling off lots before the merger proce process actually begins. Currently, we merge substandard lots only when a development application is being processed. 
The Planning Commission recommends that your board initiate a comprehensive lot merger program. It's not moving on to the next slide here. Um, initiate a comprehensive lot merger program for residential zone substandard lots and that the process begin by merging lots occurring on undeveloped or vacant parcels since these are the lots that are more apt to be in sold off hence are more vulnerable. So we're recommending a the Planning Commission and staff are recommending a comprehensive uh, yes that's good thank you uh, recommending a uh, comprehensive uh, merger process uh, that focuses, at least in the initial phase, on vacant or undeveloped lots as being most vulnerable. Um, we have determined that uh, such approach could prevent a potential selling off of over two, 700 substandard lots that otherwise could be unanticipated new building sites. And here again, this states catching up with the graphics here. This is the Planning Commission recommendation, comprehensively merge residential zones, substandard lots, up to 5,000 square feet of the zone in minimum parcel size, minimum parcel size, and phase one would be to focus on undeveloped parcels. Um, the next and final topic relates to establishing limits on ground level impervious surfaces, as well as limits on winter grading. In terms of background, uh, surface water runoff can result in flooding, soil erosion, and depositing, con depositing contaminants in coastal waters. Impervious surfaces such as pavement and decking can accelerate surface runoff, whereas uh, pervious or porous surface can surfaces can reduce runoff and its consequences. And the same uh, goes for unchecked winter grading, which could induce uh, erosion and sedimentation while properly contained grading sites can prevent such an outcome. Currently, San Mateo County complies with federal and state stormwater pollution requirements through CCAG's countywide stormwater pollution protection program known as STOP, the STOP program. And it's a, it has been um, granted permits from the Regional Water Quality Control District as meeting federal Clean Water Act requirements. Uh, and has been deemed a comprehensive and effective pollution prevention program. The STOP program rec uh, requires best management practices for new development, including erosion and sediment plans. Where appropriate, the STOP program requires that berms be installed to direct runoff to, towards uh, pervious areas and that, pounds and that ponds and swales be used to collect runoff um, for soil infiltration. Um, and the detention basins be constructed to store runoff when necessary for release after a storm. In addition, biofilters, filtration strips, and vegetated depressions can be required to filter pollutants. These are best management product, uh, best uh, management uh, practices that the STOP program, uh, which, as I said, has been is operated by CCAG and through the individual jurisdictions, and these are some of the measures that they use. The Planning Commission supports the STOP program and proposes that it, but, but does propose that it go farther in two areas. Specifically, the Commission recommends that the Board establish a 10% limit on the amount of parcel area covered by pavement or other ground level impervious surfaces with a cap for large parcels um, set at approximately 1,200 square feet. And what this means is that porous materials would be required once the 10% limit is exceeded. So basically, this only applies to ground level structures, structures that are less than 18 inches, not the house or the bu other buildings, but ground level structures, typically pavement or uh, non-porous decking or whatever. And the, the standard of the control that the Planning Commission is recommending is 10% is of parcel size can be allowed, would be the limit for impervious surfaces after that you would have to use materials that were porous. It doesn't mean that you can't have pavement after that or you can't have decking. It just means you have to use porous materials. Um, before closing, oh, excuse me, winter grading, I want to cover that. Lastly, the Planning Commission recommends that your board prohibit winter grading unless it is shown the rigorous site containment will occur to prevent erosion and sedimentation. And since we're asking your commission to take tentative approval on these topics, I would like to very quickly recap the Planning Commission recommendation. I have it just as bullets, and I'll go over this really quickly. It's a repeat of what I've just said. Regarding residential build-out, the Planning Commission recommends that your board, one, accept the updated data as accurate based on the current available inf information, and two, that you direct staff to develop 
a program to identify the number of unpermitted second units and to facilitate their legalization. Regarding infrastructure demand at build out, the Planning Commission recommends that your board accept the updated data as accurate based on the current available information and to that the county complete the ongoing hydrological studies that are underway uh, to, determine, to determine available water resources and that growth be planned to the level that the available resources can support. Regarding traffic mitigation requirements, the Planning Commission recommends that uh, your board um, continue to require local road mitigation fees, that you continue to apply CCAG's requirements for the large projects, but in addition that you require TDMs for projects that generate less than 100 peak hour trips but not exempt from CEQA, and that also you study expanding a shuttle service to the Bayside. For uh, mid-coast residential substandard lots, the Planning Commission rec recommends that you accept the updated data as an accurate estimate um, regarding the number of substandard lots and that you, the Planning Commission recommends that you comprehensively merge applicable residential zone substandard lots, either up to 5,000 square feet or the minimum parcel size uh, as applicable and with phase one being that you merge undeveloped parcels. And re finally, regarding impervious surfaces and winter grading limits, the Planning Commission recommends that you maintain the countywide uh, CCAG-sponsored STOP program, stormwater pollution prevention program, including future program improvements, but in additionally, for the unincorporated mid-coast, that you limit uh, parcel area, area uh, covered by ground level impervious services, as I described with the 10% parcel, so, uh, parcel limit, and uh, that there is an exemption with qualifications, and that's discussed in the staff report. And finally, that uh, you prohibit winter grading unless it is shown the rigorous site attainment will occur to prevent erosion and sedimentation. And finally, I'd like to note that, uh, I think they're good. At the last, uh, that would conclude my staff presentation. I'd like to add that um, Supervisor Tissier had requested that color graphics of the, all of the <coughs> Uh, items that I showed at the study session be available. We have those today for your board and I will distribute them afterwards. So that would conclude my staff presentation. Before we move to the public hearing, are there any questions for George on the staff presentation? Supervisor Hill. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, George, very, as usual, excellent presentation. Uh, a couple of questions on the uh, TDM that, that are requested, uh, the additional TDM work that's re re requested for uh, under 100 uh, units. And going back to the TDM work that you described here, or TDM in place, are those included in the LOS figures for 2010? Mm. So are, I, I are the current I LOS, the, right. the current the, TDMs that are in place, has that been taken into consideration <laughs> for the LOS levels that are established? No. I'd have to turn to Mark. Who and he's Mark turning and no. shaking his head no. Oh, okay. right. Thanks, Mark. So do we know what effect that would have on the uh, level of service in um, 2010? It, it would, well, it would improve the situation if, if TDS were put into place and people were van pooling, car pooling, or compressed work weeks, but to the degree to move it out of an F to a service level E, that I'm not certain. But it would make a marginal improvement. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mark. And until you see what the programs developed are, it's hard to estimate the, the outcomes. Okay. Great. Thanks. And another question, if I could. Um, uh, Supervisor Tissier asked for those parcels, substandard parcels under 2,500 square feet. Do we know what the the size breakdown is for all of those parcels? Under 2,500? Oh, no, under 5,000, I'm sorry. Uh, we, we just did the first step of it. We could do that. I, and what they, they, you know, the percentage right. of each? Um, I can get that information. What I, what, I did, what I was able to do from the study session till now was to get a detailed breakdown of the size of all the very small under 2,500. I can get a more comprehensive. Uh, but do you know right offhand if, if there's any particular curve that, that they most fall under in terms of size? Oh, well, yes. The, the uh, substandard uh, one. Just from my experience, it, the, the most common and typical size is 2,500 to 3,000. Far, far and away, that's the most common size. Okay. And one last question, if I may. The, in the recommendation, it says uh, <coughs> under roadways, it says complete hydrological studies to determine available water resources and plan growth to the level that the available resources can support. How would that, how could that be done? If we're going to establish in this process a growth rate for the future, 
Would that be modified in the future at some later date, uh, amended, well, if we were to determine that the hydrological studies determined that there was more available resources? Let me tell you, resources? I'll try to answer that. The Planning Commission, staff was not recommending that as at the Planning Commission level. This was a recommendation that that wording be added from the Mid-Coast Community Council. I've interpreted that wording as when all of the information is, is in related to uh, water supply availability, that the board as a separate and subsequent future effort, effort reevaluate your land use policy, reevaluate if you, whether we, whether it is still the objective to have build out at where it is, and it, looking at the map on the screen, if, if it ends up that it is determined the water resources are less, uh, would not be available to accommodate the plan build out now, that you, at a future date, the board would look at reevaluating land use policies, uh, much like uh, to revising what is permitted in certain areas that are colored so there'd be less density. So you're talking about less density. Less I, density. I was thinking more in terms of greater density, if that was possible. They well, were that would be too. I guess, I think, yes, so it I, would go both ways. I go both ways. I think it's basically, it's a state, uh, you're right. It's a statement from the Planning Commission, try to s achieve carrying capacity. Okay. Whether I think that's really what it's trying to say. Thank you. Thank you. All right, are there any uh, further questions from members of the board at this point? Uh, Supervisor Tissier? I, I have a question. In When you were talking about second units, you use a statement um, that we would facilitate their legalization. Yes. In what manner? Was there, are we being specific in that or is that just a broad well, statement? Well, the direction is that we would develop a program. The way I would envision the program, and I think the spirit uh, is communicated by the Planning Commission, is that it not be punitive, The in terms of like an amnesty program, it's not that we weaken the rules or requirements for second units or the code or building code or planning requirements, but we don't establish fines because people didn't come in up to this point. We, what we do is we provide opportunities and incentives for people to come in and get on and apply for the permit. They'd be subject to the same regulations that people who have done it uh, up front previous to this. There wouldn't be any le loosening of the regulations, but there wouldn't be a punitive element that because uh, we caught you, so to speak, or that you've been red tagged, that there's going to be fines. So that, that's I, that's how I have interpreted the spirit uh, the spirit of that planning commission recommendation. That we try, and the out the reason for that is um, our land use plan allows for 466 second units in the urban mid coast. Currently, we are only about 70 have come in and going through the permit process. It's become more expedited because of changes in state law, but still there's about 70, 75 second units. The community has told us that there are m many more out there, but they haven't come around, come in and gone through the per uh, process. In addition to assuring that they conform with the health and safety issues that are involved, we would like them to be counted so, we, the, so they are a part of us reaching the limit of 466. We don't reach 466 with the people that came in and then we say, but build out has been exceeded because there's like 200 others out there that we don't know about. So we want to avoid that situation. Mm -hmm. I was hoping you'd mention that amnesty because we did that in Daly City and it was very successful and it really is a health and safety <coughs> issue and that's the real concern there. Uh, the other question I have in that second unit, if you did do an amnesty program and you'd legalize these second units, do they, what category do they fall in? Do they fall into affordable or is that something to be determined at a later date? How does that? My understanding is that at this at this point they don't receive any in, uh, benefits or uh, that go along with priority uses for affordable housing, but in achieving may I ask Mark are they accounted in achieving our housing goals? No, it's not. In, it's it's I guess an ancillary use of your residential property for in-laws, but it's not considered affordable housing. But does it get counted as a separate unit when we talk about build out? <coughs> Uh, it, especially the ones that aren't category. noted now? In, when we look at build-out, we look at how many primary units are, are allowed according to the plan and how many second units are allowed according to the plan. And it falls in that second okay. category that has a cap at 466. Got it. Okay. I got you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any further questions? Um, just a reminder, we're going to momentarily open the public hearing. If you do not have a speaker slip in now, uh, I will not be calling on you. So uh, this is the last call uh, for speaker slips. The, um, um, I also uh, want to advise you that uh, uh, we uh, 
our meetings are um, are videotaped uh, for rebroadcast, and uh, we will um, shortly uh, reach a point on the tape where we'll need to take a brief break, uh, and we'll do that. We have, um, I think, 37 speakers. Uh, everyone will have two minutes. Uh, and um, I'm going to call two names at a time, and if the, the second person would be uh, ready to, uh, to be at the microphone immediately following the first, that would be helpful to, to move us along um, so that sometime today people can have lunch. Um, the uh, public hearing is now open, and the first speaker is Dave Byers, to be followed by Jeff Peck. Uh, good morning, President Gordon, members of the board. Uh, Dave Byers on behalf of two clients this morning, CPALS and the California School uh, Employees Association. I'm going to be very brief because I only have two minutes. The CPALS project is an office park combined with a live workspace for developmentally disabled and delayed adults. There's one particular policy in this plan that could prevent that project. It's the impervious surface policy. If you look at the background material on pages 62 to 72 of the handout that came out the last time we were here, for every zoning district, the planners had the exact same language. Impervious surface cannot exceed 10% or 1,170 square feet, whichever is less. There is one M1 parcel in the coast side. That's where we want to put the office park. It's 15 acres large. If you took 10% of 15 acres, you could have 60,000 square feet of parking. This ordinance would only allow you to have 1,170 square feet of parking. You can't park an office park with 1,170 square feet of parking. I would ask you to exclude the M1 zone from the impervious uh, rule. The second thing with regards to California School Employees Association, they own something called the North Beast Affordable Housing Site. I have no idea if this impervious surface rule would have a negative impact on that affordable housing site. The reason is that site happens to be zoned PUD because of the last time when the board did approve a tentative map. But I do believe it's possible that that could have a negative impact on the affordable housing site owned by the California School Employees Association. So I would like you to have the planners check that particular issue. The final comment I'd make is simply that merging the lots in the coast side will not promote affordable housing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Jeff Peck to be followed by Ann Carey. Sir, I'm sorry you're too late. Yeah, hello, my name is Jeff Peck. Uh, I am the father of a 16-year-old developmentally delayed daughter and 50% owner of Big Wave LLC. I'm here to ask for your support of a project, Big Wave, that is crucial to the 80-plus families with developmentally delayed children on the coast side. Big Wave will provide the environment to encourage DD adults to become truly independent and self-sufficient. It will provide the DD adult community affordable housing, employment opportunities, equity building possibilities, a learning center for continued education, and exercise and recreational facilities geared to the special needs of DD adults. On the commercial side, what will fund this DD community, Big Wave will provide clean, high paying jobs locally in an aesthetically pleasing campus environment. Although there are several proposed LCP amendments that could severely affect <laughs> Big Wave, there are two issues about which we are particularly concerned. One is proposed restriction on residential permits. If adopted, these restrictions could stop this project dead. The other concern is the airport overlay, overlay restrictions. In its present state, the LCP has severe restrictions on building within what I think is 145 feet, uh, 145 feet of airport road. Such an extreme regulation kills the effective use of six acres of big weight property. That's six acres we otherwise could use for a gymnasium, a community center, a greenhouse, usable open space, assembly plants, and office buildings. So during your decision-making process, 
Please seriously consider how your decisions will affect the success of this project. Keep in mind how important this project is to the de de developmentally delayed children, to their parents and families, as well as to the broader community. Reject the proposed reduction in building permits that could kill this project. Remove the existing airport overlay regulations. Uh, I think together we can build something that's very special for our extremely special children. Thank you, Mr. Peck. Uh, we will be taking up those items at a separate hearing uh, on the airport overlay and the uh, residential in Princeton. And carried to be followed by uh, Lance Castle. Good morning, President Gordon and honorable supervisors. I would like to touch on two points. Uh, the first is in infrastructure capacity at build out. My concern is not with the data. My concern is with the, um, that nowhere do we discuss potential improvements to infrastructure. The data that's presented to you today compares the demand for infrastructure at build out to present day supply without any mention of potential improvements to infrastructure. We know that today we have certain inadequate infrastructure, yet the growth rate over the past years, uh, 20 years, has only been 42 percent of what has been allowed. And so at the future meeting, the LCP update does analyze the growth rate, but nowhere does it analyze the need and ability to increase infrastructure capacity. The improvement of infrastructure is of great importance to all of us. In regards to comprehensive lot merger program, in addition to comprehensive lot merger, there are other ways that the county preserves planned build out in density. For example, the board has enacted an extremely successful incentive policy for voluntary merger, which has resulted in almost all of the lots being merged in the East Miramar area. Changes to public works policies could greatly further the county's success in preserving build out. For example, Granada Sanitary District will only grant at most one sewer permit every six months to non-conforming lots. Although this policy creates a market for merged and conforming lots, it also limits the ability to build on conforming parcels, especially those with orphan lots or those who have purchased the lot as a more affordable alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lance Castle to uh, be followed by Joe Chamberlain. Thank you, President Gordon and Board of Supervisors. I'm a lifelong life uh, Coastside resident. I'm a fourth generation builder on the coast. I was present here uh, January 28th with the information provided to us. Um, and I appreciate the studies given to us, the biological studies. The, in my opinion, a skewed report on, on what's necessary. What, what I have seen is a study that lacks a study on, on myself, for example. Lacks, I don't know if it's a lack of knowledge or lack of concern. But myself, I live on the coast, earn my living on the coast, go to school there, coach my children in sports. 100% of my income is derived by living on the coast. I hire a number of contractors. I listed them, grading contractor. I don't know exactly what a study would show, but I would believe he has about 30 uh, employees. Going down the list, I have a plumbing contractor who lives on the coast, employs himself and his son. Concrete finishers, electrical contractor, a roofing contractor, my painting contractor, my sheet metal and heating contractor, hardwood floors, carpet, drywall, and landscaping. I myself 100% income on the coast. Those, I'm not sure, I'm not doing the study, but it's somewhere between 15, 75%, I would assume. I wonder if there should be an economical study on what this would affect the coast side, if we need to travel over the road to earn an income elsewhere. These folks that live here, and earn an income here, our shopping in our stores, buying our supplies on the coast. We take the time after to coach our children in, in youth activities. Um, I'd like to see it, something done on this uh, facet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Castle. Joe Chamberlain uh, to be followed by uh, Stephen Fryer. President Gordon, honorable Supervisors, it's a pleasure to speak with you. 
about the um, Planning Commission's recommendation for this segment of the LCP, and I would like to speak in favor of it. I live in unincorporated San Mateo County, Lobitos Canyon, which while it's south of this particular area is of course impacted by anything that occurs because of the, tr the traffic corridor and the impact on the overall community. One of the, it took me 30 years to move to the coast because it was such a beautiful place and I wanted very much to live there. And I know and I recognize and honor that the reason the coast is the condition that it is, which is rural with not high density development, is because it really is a resource for the entire county. And we certainly see this when we talk about recreation is the term I think we normally hear used. However, those of us who live on the coast recognize our responsibility to the entire county to see that the coast is accessible, that the open space is accessible, and that is convenient for people to come. The reason the coast is there in the condition it is in is because the people on the bayside want it. They want it as their resource, and they want it to continue in the rural development stage that it is. And we have a responsibility on the coast side and throughout the county to see that we maintain that. So I speak in favor of the current uh, proposal before you from the Planning Commission, and I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Fryer, followed by uh, Gail Erickson. Morning, President Gordon and members of the board. My name is Steve Freer, and I live in Half Moon Bay, where I've come to fully appreciate what level of service ENF means on our local highways. Briefly, I would less like to say that I fully support the position of the Committee for Green Foothills with regard to the amendment to the Mid Coast LCP. And the committee's position, I believe, was presented to you in their letter of 20 January uh, 2005. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gail Erickson to be followed uh, by Chuck Kozak. My, na my name is Gail Erickson, and I live in El Granada. I'm also a member of the Mid Coast Community Council, but I'm speaking to you today on behalf of myself and some of my neighbors. I've been getting lots of calls from neighbors who have a lot of concern about the development that's going on now in El Granada. And I'd like to talk about some of the impervious, sur the impervious surfaces uh, guideline particularly. I have a number of neighbors right now that are really concerned about flooding that they see going on. Today's a good day to see what can happen. And I think right now some of the building that's going on, particularly in very highland areas like El Granada Boulevard is a very good example. I've gotten neighbors in El Granada Boulevard who contacted me about this. The number of building going, the building going on right now and the grading going on right now on days like today is changing that whole street. Right now we have a lot of small hillside streets in El Granada. They really can only handle so much. And I think some of our neighbors are concerned not so much about what the future build out can be, but the problems they're going through right now. So I think these are really two very, very important things to consider. The current build-out numbers, making sure that's correct. The impervious services, putting a restriction on that. I have no problem with that, and my neighbors certainly don't either. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Uh, Chuck Kozak uh, to be followed uh, by Barbara LeVay. Morning, President Gordon, members of the board. Um, Chuck Kozak, 1465 Buena Vista Avenue in Montero. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to comment on this. I'd uh, like to state my basic support for the position that uh, was reflected in the Mid-Coast Community Council letter um, and quickly point out a couple things. Um, Supervisor Tessier, you had mentioned the, uh, the Daily City program. Um, uh, the Mid-Coast Council had supported the idea of an amnesty program um, as early as last year, and we had found that the Daily City and the San Carlos programs would be very good starting points um, to begin to look uh, uh, for looking at a similar one here. Um, uh, it's important to note um, that George's figures that he's given you on the infrastructure were based on the proposed merger policy going through. And um, um, if you don't, um, um, if that is not implemented, you would have an 8% increase in the number of houses, which wipes out that 6% surplus that you saw on the SAM plan figures. So we're running razor thin on these numbers, um, and that's. If the identified unmerged and undeveloped parcels were developed, that would be 800 more water connections that we don't have. That would be 1,600 more cars on roads that can't handle them. That would be 1,100 more children for schools and recreational facilities that don't exist. 
Um, we need to uh, uh, control the amount and the rate of growth uh, that's in the mid-coast in order to come up with the kind of coordinated planning that you're hearing about um, um, today that we lack. Um, we can't count on the Granada Sanitary District to regulate uh, you know, our growth by sewer permits. We need to have a coordinated effort and we need to have a long-range plan. Um, very briefly, um, to address Mr. Byers' um, um, comment about the, um, um, uh, the impervious surface uh, paving, um, there was a um, section in that proposal that was for the Princeton area, uh, just very briefly to finish up, um, uh, that was for the Princeton area that would allow more than 10% of paving provided that uh, you know, proper drainage treatment facilities were put in place and this would, um, was to allow the sort of industrial level type of development. I don't see any reason why that could not be extended to the M1 also uh, you know, to take okay. care of that. All right, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Barbara LaVey uh, followed by Gloria Clark. Good morning. I'm Barbara LeVay. I'm with Coldwell Banker out of Montero on the coast. I'd like to discuss three points to the calculation of the residential build out. My first one is as many as 700 units of housing are not accounted for in the proposed build out figure of 7,153. This build out number automatically assumes that the Board of Supervisors will force mergers of non conforming urban and rural parcels. Secondly, Residential build-out count should only include occupancy permits issued, not building permits issued. It's unfair and inaccurate to consider building permits issued towards the build-out when the homes may never be built and consequently never impacting the existing infrastructure. For example, I've been involved firsthand in witnessing clients who have tired from the building pr process, the development process. They abandon their plans, they sell their lot, the new buyer applies for a new permit because he doesn't really particularly like the existing plan. Now, I'm wondering, who, how are we accounting for that abandoned permit? This is why we're uh, proposing counting occupancy permits versus building permits in calculating the residential build-out. My last comment is that we agree with the Planning Commission that um, second units, affordable housing units, and mixed use units and caretakers quarters in Princeton should be exempt from the build out calculation. We should do all that we can to encourage the construction of more affordable housing. Counting these units toward the build out only serves as a disincentive. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gloria Clark to be followed by uh, Carrie Leon. Honorable Richard Gordon and uh, Supervisors, I'm here to talk to you about affordable housing and second units. Um, first of all, that's a very big, important uh, criteria that we need on the coast. And I want to also say that affordability is also compromised by all the layers of government that people have to go through in order to build. Uh, not only for the person who has to go through all the different departments, but the cost of time that it takes to get something built in this county. Se whether you call them second units or granny flats or in-laws, they are undeniably an invaluable asset for families and homeowners in the community and a source of permanently affordable housing. Right now, to get a legal second unit, you need another sewer connection, and that's about a $17,000 item. Second units provide, promote closer family relations by allowing families to have their elderly parents live with them, or now, with high rental costs, adult children are able to uh, live there in a slow economy. With their smaller sizes and limited privacy, second units command lower rents and will remain affordable in providing a permanent source of housing for the community. With the higher housing costs in our area, some families could lose their homes if they didn't have the supplemental income from a second unit to help with their monthly mortgage payments. Also, a legal second unit can help a buyer to purchase a property because the income can count toward their income to afford the property. For all these reasons and more, Sam Carr supports the Planning Commission's recommendation to develop a program to identify the number of unpermitted second units and facilitate their legalization. Second unit amnesty programs have been implemented with success in Daly City and San Carlos. We, 
we encourage the county to review those policies. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Carrie Leon, followed by uh, Bob Nitten. Hello, President Gordon and Honorable Supervisors. My name is Kari Leone. I've lived in El Granada now for three years. I moved from the coast of Oregon. And I wanted to talk about the infrastructure demand at Build Out. Living on the coast, I've noticed that there are several health and safety concerns that need to be addressed. For example, the roads currently on Highway 1 and 92, even this morning driving in the rain, there was the ambulance and the fire truck coming and the cars were all partying and there would have been accidents happening on the highway as people were doing their commute to work or taking their children to work. Also, I would like to see that the infrastructure needs and wants of not only the residents but also the workers that work on the coast and the tourists who come to enjoy our mountains and oceans also be taken into consideration. The specific in infrastructures that I'm talking about are the road, sewer, water, and the wells, and that we could do this through conservation and efficient management. Currently, to my understanding, is that um, Supervisor Gordon in an earlier meeting had mentioned that the water infrastructure assessments should also take into account other water sources such as on-site wells. We would like to have these counted into the current water um, sources that are available. In addition to, I want to address the private property rights. Moving to the coast, people assume that when they purchase a vacant piece of property or that they purchase a home, that they would be able to work um, with the county or with the city of Half Moon Bay to be able to get their sewer or their water or an addition put onto their homes. Currently, there are several layers that make this very difficult for property owners to do this. So we ask that, the, um, that considering that the infrastructure at build out take into consideration also that the private property rights of people living on the coast. Lastly, I just want to um, thank you so much for taking these into consideration and making our coast a great place to live. All right, thank you. Uh, Bob Midden followed by uh, Jan Gray. Thank you, uh, uh, President Gordon. Um, my name is Bob Mitten. I'm a Coastside resident, um, also a member of the Board of Directors for SAMCAR. Um, we have many things to discuss about the LCP, but I rise to uh, talk about the substandard lot mergers. Um, specifically, uh, a few points. Forcing the mergers may or may not be, or is, may not be legal, but it's costly and, and fairly punitive, um, and it seems extremely unfair. The, uh, as a former rural area, the mid-coast has been divided over many successions of uh, families, and the, uh, as each generation passes, the land passes on to their children. Um, there's no, um, the lots that we have that are substandard now were legal when they were subdivided, and they were downzoned ex post facto. There's no reason to penalize or punish the people that own those lots. Second, the proposal to merge parcels up to the zoning minimum size is punitive in our estimation. In areas such as Miramar and Seal Cove, parcels could be uh, forced to merge up to 10,000 or even 20,000 square feet, res respectively. Um, even if a 5,000 square foot lot or, um, would be more than adequate to put a house on, and in some places such as Montera, and as some of the earlier speakers have uh, mentioned, a 3,000 square foot is fine for a uh, low to moderate income housing. Third, um, mergers have, should reflect the underlying parcel map. Uh, there are parcels that have been divided specifically in uh, Miramar Seal Cove, but also in other areas, where uh, you will create essentially substandard lots, or you will have the merging of lots that will create, uh, uh, will be impossible to uh, build on, even if you force them. Um, Many of you are probably familiar with the nightmare that's going on in Half Moon Bay. I urge you not to repeat that. Um, forcing the uh, uh, lot mergers can create a can of worms for everyone. Uh, defining what uh, happens with title ownership and development credits is uh, going to be an issue that's going to be tough to track. So I would suggest that uh, you look at a, a more proactive approach of uh, creating a incentive program instead of forcing unintended consequences. Thank you. Jan Gray, uh, Jan will be the last speaker before we take a short break. 
Good morning. My name is Jan Gray. I live on the coast and have since 1968. Seen a lot of changes occur over there. But well, I'm speaking today on the potential merger of substandard lots. According to the staff, there are approximately 1,600 substandard lots. Some of these could translate into a needed supply of low to moderate income housing for people just starting out or people who are retiring and their income uh, would allow, I mean, the smaller house would allow them to remain on the coast. They, these would produce smaller houses, but there's nothing wrong with small houses. It does not devalue the neighborhood. It does not make the neighborhood come, uh, become anything other than what it already is on the coast. An amazing mix of large houses, small houses, etc. Smaller houses like townhouses and condominium are highly desirable because they allow young couples to build equity or single people to start on the road of home ownership. And they also are ideal for the empty, empty nesters and the senior citizens who no longer need a large house but yet want to remain on the coast where their roots have been established. As previously expressed by the county manager as part of the LCP update process, the Board of Supervisors, you will be confronted with a policy decision between existing policy for lot mergers and the general policy for more affordable housing. We hope that the Board of Supervisors will adopt policies to create more affordable housing by not forcing the merger of substandard lots. Perhaps the Board of Supervisors could come up with uh, a, an incentive plan for mergers, which would be more compatible than just forcing the mergers. I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Uh, we do uh, need at this point to uh, change the uh, videotape. We will take a five minute recess. Uh, when we come back, uh, Judy Taylor will be our first speaker. The, um, the first speaker will be uh, Judy Taylor to be followed by uh, Michael Martin. Reminder, everyone has two minutes. Uh, if someone has made your point, you can simply reinforce that. Judy. Somebody left their coffee here. <laughs> um, good morning. Um, <laughs> Uh, the first comment that I'd like to make is um, more basically philosophical, and that is that we are still arguing about a lot of ifs, and the fight has been fought and basically won. We have limits geographically, we have limits annually, we have limits numerically. What we're jousting about right now with this non-conforming lot issue is whether the build-out's going to be 6,800 or 70, 7,100. I mean, it's, it's really pretty much of a non-issue but it's sucking so much of our resources in terms of time and energy to deal with it. It'd be really nice to just get that resolved and move on. Um, I have a real issue with looking at infrastructure and then coming back and re-evaluating build-out numbers based on that. Because basically what we're telling people is that the Constitution gives everyone a right to use their property within certain limitations. But the people that are on the coast side now don't want to look at, at conservation. They don't want to look at expanding infrastructure. They don't want to do what is necessary to allow other people to enjoy what they do. And I have a real philosophical issue with that as, as a civil libertarian. Um, 
Traffic is a problem everywhere. It's not just on the coast side. I think just about every community in the Bay Area could look at the same kind of charts. You just have to change the names of the streets. We really have to start looking at very real traffic solutions, and that's going to have to be addressing the jobs housing imbalance. And on the coast side, that means that we have to create jobs where the housing already is. And to that end, the issue with impervious surfaces uh, seems to me to be very onerous. You can talk about expanding it to you know, this area and that area, but if somebody wants to do a mixed use in a C1 zoning district, it's a problem. And just to finish, um, Supervisor Gordon, several years ago you put together a task force to work on some issues, bringing together all of the people that had some expertise and some agendas there. I'd encourage you to do the same with these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Martin to be followed by Mary Lou Williams. President Gordon, Supervisors, my name is Michael Martin. I've been with Ocean Colony Realty on the coast for 22 years. Um, I'm here today to talk a little bit about the non-conforming substandard lots. I would like to encourage you to create a task force in which you could uh, determine factual relevant understanding of the issue and come up with some incentives to create lot mergers using uh, right to build or transfer development right incentives to encourage those people to merge their lots. Um, I built a house on a substandard lot between two, in my business we call them buckets because they're not very nice houses, ill-kept, ill-maintained, Ill and both of the people tried to stop me by saying that I was gonna ruin the neighborhood and I. I won my right to build by showing the planning commissioners pictures of what was actually going on. Um, we need affordable housing on the coast and some of these substandard lots, not necessarily all of them, but some of them would provide an excellent opportunity for smaller houses, for older people, for younger people, for single people, for people that don't have the, the income to buy our ever increasing prices. Um, we need people to, we need our children to stay on the coast. So I'd really like to encourage you to create, again, a task force like you did so successfully before to really look at the issue of uh, combining uh, substandard lots. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mary Lou Williams uh, to be followed by uh, Terry Gossett. Good morning, supervisors. Um, my name is Mary Lou Williams. I live in Half Moon Bay. I have a 21-year-old son who is in an electric wheelchair with cerebral palsy and is visually impaired. In the last seven years, a group of parents on the coast side have come together. We started with six. We are now a group of 85 strong families of disabled children on the coast side. Our group is the Coast Side Parent Action League for special needs children and adults, or CPALs. So, Jeff Peck already described to you the project that he is interested in pursuing for the benefit of our children in the future. A live-work community, a recreational area, a place where the kids are safe, and one of the issues is obviously building permits, but this is zoned M1. The other one is the impervious grading, or impervious surfaces. There is one thing to keep in mind about this project. Most of our children aren't drivers. Most of our children are not gonna be driving cars. So that's an important issue, you know, when it comes to permitting this partic uh, possible project. Um, I also understand that there's been talk of limiting things to one story. I guess that's a whole different um, subject, but that certainly concerns me. Because the idea would be to build housing above retail workspace so that our children could actually live there and have jobs available to them like, um, well, any number of ideas have come up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Terry Gossett, uh, who will be followed by Mike Farrar. Hello, President Gordon and the board and the staff. Hello. Uh, I'm Terry Gossett from Moss Beach for Californians for Property Rights. 
And first, I wanted to thank you and the staff for increasing the public noticing. I think that's a huge step above the minimum required to notify the affected people. That's a big thumbs up. However, if you don't integrate their comments and hear them, look at your total plans, then that's a thumbs down. So keep the process going. Keep the notification going. Now let me tell you a little story. <clears throat> Fifteen years ago, there was an American Revolution. The world has caught on to it. Fifteen years ago, it was called the Integrated Product and Process Development. All big firms use it. The Boeing 777 was built that way. They take processes and products, the stovepipes, the technology, structures, engines, whatever, and they integrate them together. So what does that have to do with this LCP? Absolutely nothing. Because what you're doing, two weeks ago we had a process meeting. Now we're going to talk about six topics, six stovepipes, and then we'll do eight in two weeks and another eight. We need to integrate all that together into one whole thing. That's what we're hearing from the people as they speak today. Let me give you one example. <clears throat> on the agenda today, traffic mitigation is one of the topics. In two weeks, we'll talk about pedestrians, coastal trails, coastal act. The issue is moving people about. We need to put all those together, talk about the process, how that will happen, and then advise the people. So that the stakeholders, the people in wheelchairs, children, seniors can see how is that going to happen? How is it going to work for me? Does it even work? Marsha Raines had a good point. She deferred the April 12th meeting to April 26th. Why? So she, the staff, could synthesize these comments. I propose that you do far more than that, that you integrate these comments, present that to the affected people so they can see what is the complete plan here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mike Farrar to be followed by Catherine Slater Carter. Thank you, President Gordon and honorable members of the board. Um, Mike Ferrer, a city councilman from Half Moon Bay. I'm here to present a letter to you, which I think you now have of uh, support, unanimous support from our council for this process. We thank you for all the work you've been doing for years. Uh, we, we, th we actually, I would like to tell you that sometimes I get phone calls from people that say, gee, you have to turn on TV and watch the Planning Commission. It's really good. These folks are really talking about real things and doing good work. I, uh, our letter goes into rather a bit of detail here. We, uh, I would just like to add that in the information that we saw before, we talked about condition F in year 2010. My strong suspicion is we're going to achieve that prior to 2010. I don't argue that we'll get there by then, but I think we'll get there a little earlier than 2010. And I would just like to, uh, to mention that the city of Half Moon Bay is very supportive of trying to work on our TA priorities as to the spending levels as to when we improve, particularly Highway 1, that might be helpful in that regard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Slater-Carter to be followed by Scott Boyd. Good morning, President Gordon, honorable members of the Board of Supervisors. Um, I am going to take one minute on each of two hats I'm going to wear. First, I've been in contact with the California Clean Water Action Group. Uh, it's a statewide group that works for clean water in the state of California. They asked me to deliver a letter which I have done so. Uh, they support the Planning Commission recommendations. They are particularly concerned about the effects of um, polluted runoff into our estuaries and into our ocean um, because, as this, uh, George mentioned, we need, we need catchment on our lots and so on to keep the runoff clean. Uh, beyond that, I want to mention that I've brought the drainage issues to this board starting in about 1997 and the flooding issues. And they are continuing to get worse as more and more lots are developed in the steeper lots uphill. This is an important um, um, action on your board to improve, to approve the impervious surface coverage particularly. Um, now for the Mid-Coast Council. I've, this is my uh, fourth year on the Mid-Coast Council. I've participated in the Mid-Coast Council since about 1996 and I've um, attended almost every meeting since then. 
the merger issue um, is particularly important. Build out, or the, the LCP was initially approved using a land use plan, which was actually a study of the um, limits, um, both environmental and um, in terms of infrastructure, on what could be built in the, in the coast. We've improved our water systems, we've improved our sewer systems. But in fact, uh, the 1980 build-out numbers, which were used for planning purposes by all of the, by all of the uh, special districts, called for 6,200 u urban units. Under um, current policy, it's now more than that, and we're up to 77, that's a 77.28. That's an increase of 24.6%. Uh, and to comment, George was counting buildable parcels, not permits, when he was counting the build-out numbers. I think that's a key point. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Boyd, followed by uh, Eileen Easterbrook. Good morning, uh, President Gordon and uh, Honorable Supervisors. I'm Scott Boyd. I serve as president of the Montero Water and Sanitary District. I also serve as chair of the Sewer Authority Mid Coast side. And I'm speaking to you as an individual, but from that basis of experience, um, since we're talking about numbers today, we talked about 307, uh, pardon me, 3,719 existing uh, units on the coast side. Uh, I represent about 1,700 of those, give or take, depending on how you count those, and about 5,000 people. Uh, I want to commend the Planning Commission and the staff for their hard work. This has been a very uh, laborious process, and it's really hard to uh, deal with all of these numbers, especially when we're talking about infrastructure, capacity, and uh, planning. I want to speak specifically to self-sufficiency when it comes to water supply. Uh, our district is working hard to increase the infrastructure for available water. Uh, as you know, Montero and Moss Beach have been in moratorium for well over 25 years, so all new houses are built on wells. Um, we need the LCP update to uh, give us some hard numbers for build out so we can do our planning. Uh, we need hard numbers on this, what's going to happen with substandard lots. We need those in real numbers so we can do our planning. Um, as we develop our additional water supplies, I have to tell you, uh, we're digging wells, we're testing them, we're seeing that wells are not independent uh, supplies. We are seeing crosstalk between wells. If we pump really hard on one of our new wells, we're seeing an effect on one of our existing wells. Pretty substantial effect that's going to require very careful management of our supplies. Uh, this happens with domestic wells as well, and we need to recognize this. We also need to recognize that as we think about water and self-sufficiency, uh, people have asked us, you know, connect up to North Coast County Water up in Pacifica, connect to Coastside County Water District down in, in the Half Moon Bay, El Granada area, or find water from elsewhere. Well, we're not looking for a savior from elsewhere, and if we look at how each of these districts is, is right now solving their water problems, we look to Hetch Hetchy, we see billions of dollars in repair costs coming. We need to be self-sufficient, and we ask you to, uh, I ask you to uh, remember that the proposed shortfall out bid at build-out has to take into consideration the fact that we're still in moratorium and undersupplied right now, despite our best efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Eileen Easterbrook, followed by Kevin Lansing. Hi, good morning. I'm a Eileen Easterbrook and a parent of a developmentally disabled child, and I'm here to speak on behalf of CPALS. Um, I, one of the greatest concerns a parent has when you have a developmentally disabled child, of course, is where will that child live when I'm gone? It's not enough to put these kids in group homes because group homes open and close and they get moved from one community to the next community, and friendships are broken and having to be redeveloped as they mature and go into their older years. Well, we have a great opportunity on the coast with CPALS, with Jeff Peck's property that he is offering to develop a live-work residence community for the children, where they will be able to be owners of their own residence and will have a permanent place to live. I'm just here to support CPALS and ask that any of the amendments you look in regards to the residential permits or the airport overlay regulations wouldn't preclude this really important and progressive development from occurring. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Lansing to be followed by April Vargas. Good morning, uh, President Gordon and Honorable Supervisors. Uh, my name is Kevin Lansing. I'm a resident of Hafu Bay. I'm also a member of the City's Planning Commission, although my comments here today represent my views as an individual. 
Um, first, I'd like to congratulate the County Planning Commission for the hard work they have put in on this monumental effort. Um, and for the most part, I agree with the Planning Commission's recommendations, although I hope the Board of Supervisors will mm -hmm. consider adopting some changes that reflect the realities of current and expected future infrastructure capacity, and both on the Mid Coast and within the Half Moon Bay City limits. The first change I would like to see is a reduction in the number of residential units that constitute full build-out on the Mid Coast. Under the Planning Commission's recommendations, full build-out will increase the number of residential units by 92 percent, essentially doubling the number of units that exist today. And this is likely conservative estimate given the good possibility that the number of vacant non-conforming parcels has been undercounted. Even under the Planning Commission's build-out scenario, most of Highway 1 will experience level of service F from Pacifica to Frenchman's Creek as early as the year 20 th 2010, even considering planned Highway 1 improvements that are in the pipeline. Montana Water and Sanitary District was well short of the needed capacity to serve projected build-out. The capacities of CCWD and the Sewer Authority Mid-Coast may be just barely adequate to service build-out, but may not be if one takes into account the likely growth of both residential and commercial demand for water. I'd also like to mention something which is not covered in the staff report which is relevant to infrastructure, and that's how the build-out scenario is, is expected to affect the Cabrillo Unified School District, which is already suffering from overcrowding, antiquated facilities, lack of busing, and subpar academic achievement. It is true that the Planning Commission's recommendation to reduce the annual residential growth rate to 1% will help ease the overburdening of our, over, of our infrastructure. Nevertheless, a reduction in the annual growth rate that leaves the final build-out numbers unchanged will only postpone the day of reckoning when gridlock sets in for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, April Vargas uh, to be followed by Lenny Roberts. Good morning, President Gordon and members of the board. My name is April Vargas. I live at 377 12th Street in Montero, and I'm speaking this morning on behalf of the Committee for Green Foothills. I wanted to make a couple of comments about an issue that's very important to all of us in this county, and it is affordable housing. Uh, the committee has supported um, the certification of the second units and the, the uh, efforts to bring those into compliance through an amnesty program. But we believe that in order to ensure that second units will be affordable housing, that the board will have to take direct action to ensure that this happens. Um, we all believe that this is a great opportunity to have affordable housing, but unfortunately, as we know, um, in this day and age with housing as expensive as it, as it is, unless something very specifically is done to ensure that these units are affordable, it's very possible this won't happen. Um, that same comment also applies to the discussion we've been hearing about the merger of substandard lots and some who believe that keeping smaller lots as building sites will encourage affordable housing. Again, I have to say, and I think that anybody who uh, visits the coast or areas around here will see, that there are houses on 2,500 square foot lots that are selling for over $700,000. So again, while we do support affordable housing, I believe that the board needs to realize that in order for this to really happen, that something more needs to be done than just making it possible for this to occur. And finally, um, I think in the same vein as what I'm saying that the board needs to take action is the fact that many proposals have been brought forward. For years, we've been trying to live on the coast in a way that protects the area and also be responsible to property owners and, pu and private property rights. So now what the board needs to do, in our opinion, is follow the lead of the Planning Commission and actually enact some of these policies as an integrated group of pro proposals and policies that allow everyone to know what the rules are, why they're important, how they fit together, and how we can all work together to preserve the coast and um, the people who want to live there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lenny Roberts, uh, followed by um, Gail Yoshimino. I hope I did that right, Gail. Good morning, Mr. President and members of the board. I'm Lenny Roberts. I'm also speaking for Committee for Green Foothills. Uh, we are in support of the Planning Commission recommendations that you have before you today on the LCP sections that you're considering. Um, we, I wanted to particularly address the merger of substandard lots because I was around when the LCP was first done in 1980, um, after two years and 40 public hearings. And I think the most contentious issue for the Mid-Coast since that time has been 
the substandard lots and how the county can deal with them. It was never anticipated that those lots were going to be developed as um, individual substandard lots and to not address the problem um, has really exacerbated some of the issues that we will continue to face in the future. So I do strongly support the recommendation, recommendation of the um, comprehensive merger and also just wanted to make a comment that uh, a prior speaker addressed the fact that some areas such as Seal Cove have much larger zoning districts than 5,000 square feet. The reason for Seal Cove is that it is basically a geologic hazards park. Uh, Seal Cove fault runs through it and there's um, major land um, subsidence occurring along the ocean bluffs. So the county enacted that larger zoning to um, help people who own lots there find a site on their lots where a house could be located. If you had a 2,500 square foot lot, you could probably not, in, in certain parts of Seal Cove, you could not build on that lot due to the restraint, the constraints of the geologic um, hazards. So the large lots there are very important and it's important to merge um, the parcels that are in common ownership uh, as, as uh, the Planning Commission recommends. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Gail Yoshimino, uh, followed by Gregory Off. Good morning. That was close. My name is Gail Yoshimine, <laughs> and I live on the, uh, in Half Moon Bay. And my son has developmental disabilities. And um, <coughs> we as parents are very anxious about the feasibility of him um, being able to stay on the coast side and live independently as an adult in our community. We've become very close to probably 30 to 40 families as we work uh, closely with Special Olympic sports on the coast side. And um, we all face that, um, that, that big anxiety. And dealing with um, our children's day-to-day -day living um, <coughs> is hard. But looking at the future, it just feels like um, it, it's uncontrollable. It's overwhelming to think that our children um, can't live near us and in a community that, um, that, that can support them, where we've worked so hard to, for, for them to belong. And now um, there's a light that's come along in this vision, in this dream called the Big Wave, and with this organization of CPELs that allows us to have that kind of hope. Um, it's a project that's in motion, and you've heard about what that project is about. And I just feel that um, this is just such an important decision that can um, be a community and be a model in the world where um, our children can have a place where they belong and be and and offer something to the mainstream community too um, so i just uh, urge you to be a part of this dream come true by reviewing these amendments carefully and i entreat you not to pass any amendments that would make barriers to allow use of this land um, already zoned for development and I thank you so much for your hard work and for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, Gregory Off, followed by uh, Kimberly Brennan. President Gordon, uh, Board of Supervisors, thank you very much for your time. Uh, my name is Greg Off. I work closely with CPALS in Half Moon Bay. Uh, the, uh, the previously aforementioned uh, Developmentally Disabled and Adults Organization. <clears throat> Uh, I'm here to lend my support for Big Waves Proposed Community Center, um, the employment center and live workspaces for these children, uh, which will tremendously help help them um, help them in the community and the environment and give something back. Uh, the, the, pr the proposed LCP amendments, which in the Princeton area, if passed, would preclude this facility, um, which offers these adult children to have independent, excuse me, <clears throat> productive lives, as well as allow them to live in close proximity to their parents. Please carefully review these amendments and do not pass those which would make it difficult or impossible to allow this use of land, which is already zoned for development. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Kimberly Brennan, hope I got that right, uh, followed by Chris Michelson. Maybe it's President Gordon, Honorable Board, my name is Kimberly Brennan, and as an athletic coach with Spe Special Olympics, I work closely with CPALs and their children. I'm here today to show my support for the proposed community center that would offer 
not only jobs for the children and adults with developmental disabilities, but also a commercial center for the rest of the community. I just ask that you review any amendments closely that would prohibit the center from being built and that you do not pass the proposed LCP amendment. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Chris Michelson uh, to be followed by Ed Schmidt. Good morning, President Gordon, Honorable Supervisors, uh, Chris Michelson. Uh, President of CCWD and Vice President of Chamber of Commerce, today I'm going to be limiting my comments in the uh, Chamber capacity. Um, from the Chamber's perspective, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that it seems to be a foregone conclusion in this room that our roads will be at level F. Um, we find that very disturbing in that we are on our way to becoming an island, and in that we applaud the county for providing a map where we can have economic opportunities within our own community that which will keep us off the roads and any policy that would preserve such light industrial commercial office space uses we strongly encourage in that there doesn't seem to be a solution coming forward to uh, provide us with you know an upward e possibly even better uh, road scenario um, seems to be cast in stone here that we're headed towards that it's just a matter of when seem to be the argument today um, so, again, we would like to preserve economic opportunities, encourage the, you know, an updated map. I don't believe the city to our south has an updated map uh, showing economic opportunities. We really want to allow for viable opportunities on our coast to become more and more self-sufficient as our roads degrade. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ed Schmidt uh, to be followed by Christina Lee. Good morning, Honorable uh, Board of Supervisors. My name is Ed Schmidt, and I'm the General Manager for Coastside County Water District in Half Moon Bay. And I want to thank Mr. Bergman and uh, uh, Ms. Raines, first of all, for all the work that they put into, into this report. I know I met with my staff, uh, and I met with George at least four or five times, <clears throat> where he took the time to make sure that he understood what our capacities, our infrastructure capacities were, our water supply, and the patience that he showed was incredible. I've been through this process at other agencies, and he's one of the best I've ever seen. It's an excellent report. Uh, I noticed that um, one of the first questions that came today out from your Board of Supervisors was Supervisor Hill regarding a statement at the bottom of page 29 of the February 15th staff report, also labeled as page 18. And I'll read that. Uh, authorized by resolution, the completion of hydrological studies to determine available water resources and to the extent allowed by law, plan growth to that level that the available resources can support. And that's the only issue that the Water District has with the entire report. I think that that, is that last half of that sentence is going to be misunderstood many times in the future and possibly by accident misapplied. I think that the uh, above statement appears to be inconsistent with the overall emphasis of the LCP on planning for build-out based on sand le sound land use policies and then planning infrastructure to meet those demands. And as the chairman of the California Coastal Commission told several of us recently in a hearing, land use policies should be used for planning growth and not limiting infrastructure. And I've kept the tape recording of that message because it's, uh, it's important to remind ourselves of that frequently. Thank you very much for your help. Thank you. Uh, Christina Lee, followed by George Mazingo. Good morning, I'm President Gordon, Supervisors. Christina Lee on behalf of the San Mateo County Association of Realtors. I'm just going to summarize um, the comments that uh, members of our association have made thus far. Um, we question the accuracy of the proposed uh, mid-coast residential build-out figures because of the assumptions that it makes on the forced mergers of um, non-conforming lots. And George had mentioned, you had mentioned earlier um, that these would be unplanned and unaccounted for homes. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, local coastal plan is a plan. So if this isn't the opportunity to plan for the future and to take into account these homes and take into account these properties, for potential development or homes, then I'm not really sure where else it would go. Um, second thing is we fully embrace the efforts to identify unpermitted second units for amnesty. As mentioned earlier, Daly City, San Carlos, and 
we've forwarded copies of the ordinances for your review. And the next one is take a positive approach to infrastructure. Um, you know, don't just do studies to say, well, here's how much water we have and that's it. Or this is what our roads can sustain and that's it. Look at how to improve it over time. Look at how to expand it over time. There's no reason to have not bad quality infrastructure on the coast side. Personally, I, I don't really think I would ever want to be on the coast side during a disaster because what happens to the water? What happens to the roads? Will I be stuck there? I live in Lindemar in Pacifica, and so I get scared about that all the time. So I'm ha happy they're winding the highway there, but that's the reason. I mean, it's health and safety standards that need to be taken into account. Um, and lastly, I would, we would encourage a carrot approach and not a stick approach to the merging of lots. Um, as mentioned earlier, you know, encourage lot mergers through maybe, for example, an expedited permit process, tax grants and credits, or a finessed TDR program that would not penalize properties for having non-conforming lots. Thank you for your time. Thank you. George Mazingo, followed by James Teeter. I have nothing new to add. <laughs> God bless you. Uh, James Teeter passes. Great. Uh, Tony uh, Condotti. Good morning, Supervisor Gordon, members of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, I serve as the uh, District Legal Counsel for the Coastside County Water District. Um, I actually didn't intend to make a comment today, but I would like to follow up on something that was mentioned by Mr. Schmidt uh, in regard to the uh, statement on page 29 concerning uh, limiting new growth to the level that can be uh, made available by uh, existing resources. Uh, the Water District has faced significant opposition on projects that it has brought forward recently to improve the safety and reliability of the coastside water system from uh, people who worry about potential growth-inducing impacts of new infrastructure. And it seems to me that the corollary to the notion that providing infrastructure has growth-inducing impacts is that in order to control growth by limiting infrastructure. You need a system that's inadequate. Otherwise, there's nothing else to prevent new development from occurring. Um, the notion that growth levels should be determined by an assessment of current water supply capacity uh, stands the idea of sound land use policy on its head. Uh, sound land use poli policy should be governed by decisions about future growth and development. Uh, and then water supplies should be planned to meet the level of development um, that is planned for. Uh, for that reason, uh, the district has a concern about the statement uh, that <coughs> water resources should be limited to the, or that water, that growth should be limited to the level that is uh, provided by available resources. Um, that discounts the possibility of new and improved water resources to furnish growth that's planned for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Linda Sino, followed by uh, Juliet uh, Kulda. Good morning. I appreciate you pronouncing my name correctly. It, it never gets said that way. I am Linda Sino. I'm the client's rights advocate for Hope Services, where we provide services, uh, a whole variety of services for people with developmental disabilities. I'm here today to support the possibility for development of property owned by Mr. Peck, where low-cost housing, home ownership, and jobs would be made available for people with developmental disabilities. I'm currently developing a new community-based service in um, Half Moon Bay, and coming from Santa Clara County, I was just shocked to learn that there's no set-aside housing, there's no own opportunities for home ownership or, or any other kinds of options. Uh, housing options for people with developmental disabilities. In fact, there are no other day services for people on the coast side. As you've heard, people with developmental disabilities have to leave their home communities if they wish to work or live independently. And I would respectfully remind you that that's the expectation for all high school graduates, not only for people with disabilities. Um, um, 
With the development of property owned by Big Wave, people with disabilities would be able to continue to live in their home communities, have a good quality of life, and to reach their, their level of independence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Juliet Kulda, followed by Leonard Warren. Good morning, almost afternoon, to all the supervisors here. My name is Juliet Kulda, and I live in El Granada. I've been part of the coast side there for over 10 years in the community there. I'm a real estate agent, and my husband is a contractor, and therefore I'm very in tune with many concerns of people that have vacant land and also are uh, building or trying to build a home on the coast. Barbara LeVay mentioned earlier that she has seen clients as a, she, she's also a real estate agent, she has seen clients get frustrated as they try to build a house and they end up selling their lot in basically in a sad way because they wanted to build a dream home there and they had to give up the process, mainly because of the restrictions and the complications involved and these make things more expensive as we get more restrictions, more time, things get very, uh, even more expensive than they are. So overall, I would like to see more or less restrictions. I know a lot of people would like to see, and I know this document, there are many things that um, bring up more uh, of these kind of restrict restrictive measures. Um, there is a traffic problem on the coast today, and if there were no more houses built ever again, we would still have a traffic problem. So I would like to see some of this energy. I wish we'd put more energy into handling the problem we have now with traffic. Um, as opposed to trying to think deceivingly that if we restrict the building, we're going to solve a traffic problem. Um, I, one other thing regarding uh, non-conforming parcels, I recently was working with a lady who wanted to build a very, she wanted a very small lot just to build a very small house for her retirement. She, um, after a little bit of investigations, she realized it was um, too, she got very discouraged with the process and she gave up and she moved out of the area. And I'm wondering, is this, is this the purpose of this LCP update? Is this, is this the purpose of what we want to see with building and restrictions to see people move out of the area because they can't even build a small house? So I would like to see, it would be nice to be able to see, um, be able to use up the small lots for houses. Okay, thank, thank you thank very you. much. Leonard Warren uh, will be followed by uh, Mario Andrini, who is our final speaker this morning. Good morning, Mr. President, honorable members of the board. I'm Leonard Warren from El Granada. Uh, staff on the Planning Commission have worked hard to bring you this recommendation. It is an integrated package, and I urge you to approve it without change. That said, I would like to state for the record that I respectfully object to the constraints placed on this process from the start. Instead of changing the general plan, the LCP, to match the zoning, proper planning and state law require the zoning to be changed to match the plan. When the land use plan and LCP were approved by the Coastal Commission in 1978 and 1980, it was with an understanding of a specified build-out population. Given the number of vacant parcels, given the number of vacant residential parcels in the current population, it becomes clear that the build-out population will be much beyond what the fragile, beautiful coast side can accommodate. These are the numbers here that were approved by the Coastal Commission in 1978 Land Use Plan and 1980 LCP. If you take the build-out numbers computed by George, uh, showing that, that barely half of the residential parcels are built out now, that means that our current population of somewhere around 11,000 will be 22,000, fully a third higher than what was envisioned in 1980. And the original LCP got certified, I would submit, based on what the final build-out population was going to be. And so to have that be up by a third is, is very problematic. Um, the, the purpose of an LCP update is uh, re to uh, reaffirm the resource protections and the visitor serving attributes of the coast side by taking into account new knowledge. Uh, I would like to agree with Joe Chamberlain's comments at the beginning of the public hearing, and uh, I think CGF had good comments also. Uh, thank you for your consideration. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mario Andrini? Uh, good morning, Supervisors. Um, Mario Andrini, third generation co -sider. Um I oppose the LCP update. My family and I run a, a co construction business that we employ about 60 plus people. And 
if this goes through, it's gonna affect them and their lives and their families. It's gonna put more stress on the roadways. Um, if uh, th there's more talk about stopping growth here and trying to restrict it and you know, we should be talking about improving infrastructure and trying to make things a little better on the coast side. You know, um, that's about all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to entertain a motion to close mm. the public hearing. So moved. Um, are we closing or continuing? We're closing this, the public hearing scheduled right. for today. You're, you're closing today's, that's all. So I have a motion and I have a second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, the public hearing is closed. Let me just remind uh, the public that um, we, um, we'll, uh, we're gonna do some deliberation now uh, and some discussion here. Um, the next public hearing on this item uh, is currently scheduled for March 8th. Um, there will be um, there's a, a set of topics heard at that time that it will be set for 10 o'clock. Um, and um, as we did today, you will need to be present uh, at 10 o'clock uh, to turn in a speaker slip um, in order to be recognized. What I'm gonna suggest that uh, we do is uh, if we turn to the um, staff report um, for uh, today's item number seven, and um, e starting on page two, we have each of the key issues outlined uh, and in bold are the uh, recommendations coming to us from the Planning Commission. Um, and I'm gonna suggest that we take each of these one at a time and, and um, uh, go through them. Before we start that process, let me see if there are general questions or comments that um, anyone from the board uh, has of, uh, either of staff or comments that they wanna make in general before we start into each of these um, uh, what I guess is six uh, specific issues that we'll look at today. I Agree? guess I just have one question, and I, I'm sure, George, you probably said this before. In the past, the process has been that people have been sort of encouraged to merge their lots voluntarily, and, and some have done that. Do you know how many that have done that voluntarily over time? Um, we could get that number, we keep track of that because it's a formal process of merging. There have been different motivations for doing that. Many times it's a reduced sewer assessment or other reasons. Um, we can get that number for you. Um, when you get to the merging issue, I can uh, chime in about Planning Commission's discussions of, about related to providing incentives for affordable housing. It seems like a recurring theme in the presentation today was uh, instead of merging, sh couldn't those l individual lots be pro used for affordable housing? And I have some responses related to that when we get there. Okay, then let me suggest that uh, the key issue number one is the issue of residential build out. Um, as you can see, the Planning Commission um, recommends that we accept the uh, data that's been provided by staff um, and um, secondly, direct staff to develop program to identify the number of unpermitted second units and to uh, develop a program to facilitate the legalization of those units. It's the pleasure of the board on, uh, on this. And again, we're, what we're doing today is taking tentative action um, on these various recommendations uh, to the extent that you want to take action. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, if there's something you want to defer, we can defer that. <laughs> knowing again that we will wrap this all up and bring it into total uh, at the um, late April meeting. Well, I mean, if I could just begin, I, I think it's, we should accept the, the recommendations. I guess the question is whether we add the 700 units, the, uh, not the, uh, uh, the question of what build out is actually defined as, is it taking into consideration the merge lots or not taking into consideration the merge lots? That's the issue I guess that we have to, to contend with and to me, it doesn't matter one way or the other when you're looking at the 700 homes, we're still exceeding infrastructure. I I have a broader answer that will affect uh, all okay. of you, uh, all the topics you're mm -hmm. considering. Uh, it is my intent for the April meeting to look in the totality of all of the actions you've made at the tentative level, and if any of those require an adjustment of the build-out figures, I would bring that to you at the April meeting. So yes, in preparation, preparing my estimate of build-out, I did 
assume and include the merger. If your board chooses not to merge, then I will present uh, what I will come back with is an adjusted build out that does not include that policy. Then, then I would move to accept the recommendation. Second. Okay, we have a motion and second on um, uh, these two items. Uh, discussion on this. Rose? Um, <clears throat> on the uh, second units, I do think it, it would be helpful to me to uh, have a to be able to look at the um, pro amnesty program and also like the idea of making sure that they are maintained as affordable based on how we generally u utilize second units. I, I think that was my assumption that you we were, were going for. Yeah, I think okay. Mark, was that how you felt it? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Amnesty. Similar to Daly City. All right, so what um, um, the motion then is to accept the, uh, the build out estimate that we have in front of us at the moment, understanding that that could be adjusted later and to uh, uh, identify the number of unpermitted second units and facilitate legalization, um, understanding that uh, we'd also want to uh, understand not only the, an amnesty program, but um, issues of affordability relative to those units. That's policy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that uh, all those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Um, okay, we have adopted that one. Um, item number two is infrastructure demand, and um, the Planning Commission recommendations are on page four of the staff report. Uh, it asks us to accept the updated uh, data that, uh, as an estimate of infrastructure demand based on current information available, um, directing staff to adjust the data uh, if more accurate data becomes available, and three, to complete hydrological studies um, to determine available water resources and to plan growth to the level that uh, the resources can support. Thoughts or comments on this package? I have a few comments on this, um, and we heard some of these comments in, in the uh, public comment uh, comments that were made. Uh, to me, the uh, the missing part of the equation is the infrastructure capacity at build out. Uh, that's an important part, an important element that we just don't have. Uh, the report compares the uh, data for the infrastructure uh, de demand uh, at build out to the present day capacity, but there's no information uh, and apparently there's been no discussion of uh, potential improvements to infrastructure. Um, and if we, we are going to make an informed uh, decision uh, as to growth, uh, I think it's important that we have this information. I don't want to be put in a position where our hands are tied in making land use planning decisions because a particular utility district has uh, chosen voluntarily not to make infrastructure improvements. It seems to me that the governing principle should be that utility districts are obligated to provide enough capacity to allow build out of the land use plan. I understand that there are some actual physical constraints uh, such as in the uh, Montero Water District where there is evidence of wells drying up and of course that raises serious health issues such as salt water intrusion uh, as well as cross-contamination. But I am troubled uh, when a district such as the uh, Granada Sanitary District adopts an ordinance uh, limiting sewer hookups on non-conforming lots to one every six months. Uh, to me, uh, not issuing uh, sewer uh, permits on a substandard lot um, <coughs> is a planning issue. Uh, not a sewer delivery issue. And, and quite frankly, I'm surprised that ordinance hasn't been challenged by a property owner. Now, the board may decide to limit growth to 1%, uh, and, and that's fine. I, I, I don't know where the, the board is going to go on the growth issue. I haven't decided yet myself. All I'm saying is that we should make that decision, and we shouldn't allow uh, a, some utility district to make that decision for us. And in order for us to make uh, fully informed, intellig intelligent decisions on growth, um, I would like to request the information that's missing. And I think it's important uh, that we receive from the utility districts, all of them, specific reports as to their view of capacity, their long-term plans to service all the residents of their respective districts, and that would include existing residents and future residents at build-out. And I think it would probably be wise to uh, hear from our transportation agencies as well uh, as to plans for additional roads and improvements, CCAG and Caltrans and others. 
That's all relevant information that we need to have. Someone made the comment earlier about having a coordinated effort. I agree with that. This would be more of a coordinated effort. We need to look at long range plans by the uh, utility districts. Uh, and so that would be uh, my suggestion. And, and, I, and while I have the microphone, I'm just gonna say that I, the comments that were made regarding CPALs and the development uh, di disabled individuals, I think we should make accommodations for that facility. You, you know, and, and I, th I think Mark's making some very good points because the struggle here is that, and, and I'd like to find out where we can fit into that equation. We're almost in a catch-22 as I see it. And if we were to go forward and find develop a level of planning for build out at a particular level number down the road and it was greater than what we have here or it did show that an infrastructure was inadequate to meet those needs how we can't control those agencies that are making those decisions as mark was saying how, how there's the catch-22 how do we then be responsible in planning saying that we would allow this level of development yet there is no control over this body to guarantee that infrastructure. And I guess that's, that, that's and I think it fits right into what you're saying, it's Mark. It's a circular situation, yeah. and we need to get that information before we can make these decisions. And, and, uh, and it fits in with this item C uh, that, that you had commented on, Jerry, at this meeting. I had mentioned at the last meeting, uh, we're waiting for these hy uh, hydrological right. studies um, uh, to determine available water resources, and then we're gonna plan growth at, at the level the resources can support. Um, it would be nice to have as much information as possible, at least I'm suggesting at this point that we, we receive uh, reports from the utility districts. It, it sounds to me, if, if the, the board wants to move in the direction that you're suggesting, uh, Mark, that what we should do at this point is um, um, not adopt tentatively these planning commission recommendations, but rather uh, request that uh, uh, we uh, seek data from the uh, utility districts uh, along the lines that you're suggesting, uh, and, and I would, I think the transit districts also, transit agencies, um, and if that's the pleasure of the board, um, in order to give uh, the agencies time to respond, uh, we might want to um, ask to have that in time for, have staff work to figure out how to get that in time for our March 29th meeting when we would be discussing the um, uh, annual residential growth rate limit mm -hmm. and can maybe link that discussion. I agree, and that would be uh, my motion. I'll second that motion. Okay, uh, the motion is to uh, defer action on the Planning Commission recommendations and to seek additional information from the utilities and transit agencies. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Um, item number three is uh, traffic mitigation requirements. And uh, here uh, the Planning Commission uh, is recommending that we continue local road mitigation fees, that we apply the CCAG requirements, um, continue to apply the CCAG requirements to projects generating more than 100 peak uh, hour trips, uh, that we require TDMs for projects that generate less than 100 peak hours and are not exempt from CEQA. Um, and study expanding shuttle service between the mid-coast and the bayside. Uh, thoughts on this package? You know, I'm, I'm concerned that some of these issues will be developed in the further analysis that we get. I mean, I hate to punt in here and going off to, you know, moving it out a little further, but, but I think that through the analysis that we've asked for may develop or indicate some other traffic mitigation requirements that come from that or some other improvements that could be in place to, to resolve it. And I think it, when you look at then going into the next issues, uh, of course not number four, but number five, the merger of substandard lots, I think that's, we need the information that we requested before in order to, to really see if, if there's a problem that needs to be addressed by requiring merger. Okay, so is the uh, pleasure on the traffic mitigation again to uh, defer action uh, pending the additional information? That would be my motion. I'll second. We have a motion second to defer action on that as uh, based on the information that we would be requesting from the transit agencies. Uh, all those in favor of this motion say aye. Aye. And I don't hear any opposition. 
Um, task number four was the uh, to, uh, I guess it's, uh, George, there's no uh, bold recommendations here. What, are we being asked to uh, accept a number? No. Yes, that's an oversight in the uh, staff report. Uh, basically, it's the same general language to accept the uh, uh, the accurate the updated count of number of substandard lots as a accurate estimate based on available information. That's it. <coughs> now, was there I additional information I on this know. issue that folks were seeking? I think I had asked just to know what had happened under the volunteer efforts of merging lots. How many have taken place in you know maybe the last five years? I don't know how long people are started merging, but I'd just be curious just to see what's taken place on a volunteer effort. So we have that additional information to look at. That would probably go with number five, I would think, then before think that decision, five. because I think the number of lots of non-conforming would remain constant. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. You were just asking if, okay, yeah. Uh, I would and number four as Second. Written. Okay, so we have a motion, a second, to accept uh, the uh, staff report as it relates to the number of non-conforming parcels as a tentative decision. If there's any further discussion on that, seeing none, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? And that motion passes. Um, the next item uh, is the merger of substandard residential lots. Um, and uh, Supervisor Tissier has asked for some additional information on that. Uh, what's the pleasure of the board on this item? Continue it. Made my motion. Okay. We get the further information. The uh, and, and also in that, if you could, George, the number of the breakdown of square footage of those substandard lots. You know, maybe a little graph or chart. You, you indicated that most of them are 25 to 3,000 right. or th around there. I mean, if that's just some number would be okay. great. Thank you. And and George, you had said earlier that. Um, at the Planning Commission, there had been some discussion of incentive programs. Yes, I wanted I to just briefly overview that because much of a good uh, portion of your testimony today was offering up as a solution that the uh, vacant substandard lots that happen to be in common ownership, instead of um, merging them, your board would be missing an opportunity for the owners to independently build affordable housing on the lots, uh, separate, uh, dividing them off into separate lots. And my response to that is, um, if you look at the first bullet, it says 271 lots occur as a one lot parcel. I think that the opportunity for affordable housing currently rests with those lots. These are lots where we don't have, their merger isn't even an issue. These are single small lots that are in separate ownership. And I, if we were to focus, um, focus our energies towards affordable housing, we have a pool of lots that are a target pool that are ready and would not be affected by a merger proposal. And I think that could be uh, the emphasis for affordable housing in response to the affordable housing mm -hmm. arguments that have been made. Now, w the Planning Commission wrestled with this. Uh, the, this was not the. This is not the first time the. Uh, uh, concept of incentives came up. The Planning Commission asked staff to develop an incentive program where um, a person who owns one of the 271 vacant one parcel, one lot parcels, there would be an incentive for them to develop that as an affordable unit versus building a market rate unit. And staff had prepared a bonus program uh, as an incentive where the um, applicant, the owner, could voluntarily choose to build an affordable unit on one of those lots and there would be a bonus floor area granted to that owner. They'd be allowed to build a marginally larger house than um, those, those owners who, who chose to build a market rate unit. So you, even though it would still be a small a house that's a small house on a small lot, but it could be a larger small house if you chose to go affordable. The, we developed this program and went back to the planning commission, and there was a community opposition. The community was saying, "Yes, we want affordable housing, but we don't want it this way. We don't want a marginal. We don't want. I don't use the term marginally; it diminishes it. But we don't want a larger house. We want the smallest house on a substandard lot." So we were working on an incentive for people who had one parcel substandard lots that there'd be an opportunity, a voluntary incentive 
to build affordable housing. The Planning Commission rejected that one approach. However, they did, the Planning Commission did um, request that we come back with a comprehensive evaluation of alternate approaches for affordable housing on non-conforming par conforming parcels after your board, um, after these proceedings. Uh, I, again, um, that takes care of the parcels, the, the lots that are in yeah, single George, I, I think there's, uh, my sense is there is greater interest in understanding um, for the other lots, whether, you know, uh, the 944 that are grouped in two lot parcels or the 354 in three lot parcels, um, what are the incentives, uh, what kinds of programs can be put together to, in, to encourage the voluntary merger of those lots and to Supervisor Tissier's question, what's been our history of, of any current voluntary effort that we've had? Okay, I'll answer both of those. Uh, the outcome of the process that Supervisor Gordon uh, spearheaded, the task force, set up a two-tier approach to house size on Midcoast parcels. And an incentive was built in, um, our disincentive was built in. If you, if you had a small lot, you had a, a substandard lot, you would have a smaller house size limit, but if you chose to merge the two together, you would get the uh, larger house size limit that goes with standard size parcels. So it was an incentive to voluntarily merge uh, by get, being able to build a house with a larger floor area ratio if you chose to do that. We, we could explore other uh, that approach. Currently, the distinction between a substandard lot, a non-conforming parcel, and a conforming parcel is a several, is, is they're close, it's 0.48 and 0.53. One could reduce the distinction and say if you have a non-conforming parcel, it'll be 0.4 or the proportionality rule, but if you merge them, you'll get the, um, you'll get the larger number. Yeah, so we could, we, can, we can look at, we, we have looked at uh, different incentives. We have an incentive on board incentives. and and uh, people have voluntarily done it, have voluntarily merged for other reasons uh, not related to affordable housing, and mainly it was because of the sewer assessment fees. Okay. Uh, I think, I can't remember whether it was a motion, but if not, I think there needs to be a motion uh, to um, uh, defer action on this until we get the additional information that's been requested. Yeah, and some examples of those incentive programs that you're talking about that we've had before. And Maybe what you gave to the Planning Commission? Mm -hmm. Okay. It'd be, nice like it'd be nice to see those. Okay. So, Jerry, is that a motion? That is a motion, yes. Do I have a second? Uh, there's no further discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 <coughs> Excuse me. That motion passes also. Uh, the final, uh, or number six, is the impervious surface limit uh, and the winter grading. Here, uh, the Planning Commission has recommended that we maintain the existing stop program, um, including a future program improvements, uh, that we limit the amount of parcel area covered by pavement and ground level impervious surfaces at 10 percent, uh, and that uh, we prohibit winter grading uh, unless it's sh shown that rigorous site containment will occur. Um, I'd just like to provide a clarification to, um, it relates to the CPAL's comments that uh, Dave Byers opened up the hearing with, and uh, he is correct, there was a uh, oversight, and I'd like to just go over it real quickly, and I think we have a solution for it. If you look at the second bullet, it's a more elaborate uh, description of what's actually in the, in the staff report. The, the proposal is to have a 10% impervious surface limit, ground level impervious, for, in all zoning districts. The cap of 1170 was, was intended only for single family residential districts, and we did not make that distinction for the M1, which is the project where his project is located. What we would uh, it would suggest to your board, if you were inclined to approve this approach, it's with the understanding that we make the distinction that the cap is only for single family residential zone buildings and not the non-residential uses like the CPALS project. And so they would still be subject to a 10% impervious surface, but be based on their larger parcel, as he acknowledged that there was a larger parcel. And there's also an exemption for non-residential developments recognizing uh, parking lots, where if you can demonstrate that you can contain the runoff by other engineering ways, like cisterns or holding basins and things like that, or, or by using porous materials, 
you can get an exception to the 10 percent. And so basically, our proposal is to tinker. We, we would recommend that you approve this with the understanding that we drop the cap. Uh, I mean, excuse me, that the cap of 1170 square feet only applies to, we clarify that it only applies to R1 districts. And that I, we believe that would take care of the CPALS problem. Does it also? And that was our intent all along. Does it also, also take care of the planned development of affordable housing that he mentioned earlier too? Because that's not R1 and I would get Oh, I see, yes, that's not R1. It would take that care of that as well. Thank you. Yes. Could I just ask if maybe rather than, since we're gonna be coming back with so many of these, I'd like to see that sort of spelled out so we're certain that it fits within the guidelines. I don't want to wake up tomorrow and find out we just tied our hands to something that doesn't fit the mold of, I get the sense we're all looking at the same project and thinking that's a good thing, and I just don't want to tie our hands and find out that we did it too quickly. Yeah, let me just, I, I guess, Adrian, make two comments. I, I don't want to tie our hands, but I also want to prejudge the project that we haven't seen. Well, that's but, true. Um, and these, the, are, these are all tentative decisions right. too, so yeah. we'll, we'll have a second chance. I, I, I do think though that uh, I, I would, I personally would not have a problem with tentatively approving this with the, the change that George has suggested, knowing that when we come back, we'll, we want to make sure that we're really honed in on that. To I agree. You want to make a motion to that effect? Uh, I would uh, move that uh, tentative approval of the uh, of item number six uh, with the uh, suggested uh, uh, changes that uh, Mr. Bergman just indicated. I'll second that, and I also want to make sure that you realize I'm not prejudging the pro no, project, but I also want to make sure that we don't do something that in the reverse prejudges what we're doing. I, That's I, where absolutely, I, was going, right? I agree with you right. fully. Um, we have a motion to second. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All right, that is approved. George, there's an item number seven, which uh, on the staff report, a grandfathering pr provision which you did not uh, previously discuss. Do you want us to take action on it's tentative action on that? It's not necessary to take action on this today. This would be something that you would take action on your final hearing. I will give a brief overview since I really haven't addressed it. Um, typically, your board, uh, mainly out of a sense of fair play, acknowledges that certain projects at a certain stage in the development process when the rules change, and usually when you um, make substantial land use changes, you have a grandfathering uh, provision that would exempt projects that you have called in the pipeline. And um, this, what we're recommending is that for all of the changes, for the entire project, hence at the last meeting, that there be such a grandfathering provision so that when we get close to the approval and the ultimate Coastal Commission's consideration, someone who has already drawn up plans, has already been, we've already accepted the plans, that they would not be sent back to the drawing board because something changed a couple of days later. All right, well, we will take that up then um, uh, at, in the wrap-up session at the end of April. The, uh, any uh, further comments or questions from the board? Any further direction to staff that's necessary at this point? I have a question of George. Do you wake up in the middle of the night just thinking of this stuff all the time, George? <laughs> <laughs> it goes through your head. Uh, I would remind uh, the public that uh, the uh, next public hearing on the uh, LCP update is scheduled for March 8th. The issues to be discussed at that time are non-conforming parcel development controls, commercial and employment opportunities, the airport overlay, development controls in rural zoning districts, rural residential area boundary, lot merger in the mid-coast rural areas, um, residential uses in non-residential districts. Um, with that, uh, the uh, board will um, uh, end this part of the meeting. We do have a 1.30 uh, time set service awards to honor employees of the county who have been with us for 10, 20, 30, 40, 40 years. Uh, so uh, the board will uh, reconvene for that at 1.30. Thank you.
uh, so I'd, I'd like to, if you're interested, make that presentation to this group. I think that would be a good idea. Uh, I, not at this moment. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's on future agenda. Yes. yes. Yeah. All right. But there is going to be a water summit um, coming up in, a, in April, uh, which is going to have a lot of agencies, and you'll be invited to participate in that. Who's the lead and, in that summit? Pardon? Who's the lead? Uh, it's probably going to be National Marine Fisheries. Oh, it's that big. Yeah, no, it's this really is awesome. Pat Rutten will probably be here. Um, where? The San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. I don't know where it is yet, oh. but it'll be the end of April. And uh, CCWB will be there, of course. And so, and there'll be various environmental groups, and it's uh, so, yeah, so most of the agencies that have anything to do with water. Monterey Bay Sanctuary will probably be there. We Somebody going to arrange TV coverage? Them. Pardon? Somebody going to arrange TV coverage? I have no idea at this point. <coughs> I, I don't know. This is Could being, be. Just being set up. Keith, how does uh, a month from today sound? That's our next regular meeting. Great. Be Any happy agenda to. Agenda is that? All right, Chuck. Great. About 20 minutes. Sure. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there some place to do a projection here? Is there a screen or something? Hmm. We've not done that yet. <laughs> We could probably take the map down and do it up here. Do it right there. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thanks. Are there any other members of the public who'd like to address? Have you look at all the speaker slips that are sitting around? Yeah, this is for item two. All right, let's move into the action agenda. The first item is approval of certificate of appreciation to former director and board president Sean McGraw, who resigned. Uh, last month. I move that we <coughs> approve sending the certificate of appreciation to uh, former director McGraw. Second. Discussion? Well, we're, I'll just say I'm sorry that she had to leave and uh, wish her the best and she has worked hard while she was on here and appreciate the work she did do. And that's it. Yeah. Thank you, Sean, for all you did. I would certainly second that. I'm working both on the SAM, SAM board also. So. Now, should we be offended that she actually misses the SAM board more than us? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're on both, so you're safe. Equally. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. All right, all in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. And uh, Delia will, I guess, present this at an appropriate time for signatures, and uh, we'll get it to Sean. You want to take it, just take it to her house? Yes, I actually told her. I invited her tonight, but she couldn't make it, and I have a nice frame for this certificate, and if you can all find it this evening, I'll take it to her tomorrow. Okay. And, you, and you bought these frames in bulk, right? <laughs> 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 Not any we appreciate. Um, all right, item number two is the consideration of a Class 1A and Class 3 permit applications for Adriana Kelly and uh, on First Street in Miramar. And we have a speaker slip from Michael Fogel <coughs> on this item. Um, I don't know if I should speak at this time. Or probably need to hear the staff. Manager. Yeah, and maybe, you may be available to answer questions. Yeah, yeah then, then all right. speak at that point. Uh, Mr. Fogley for your daughter, I believe? Yeah. Yeah. Had, had, yeah. They have applied for a Class 3, which is a public sewer main extension, and a Class 1A permit, which is for a single family residential. Uh, they have previously paid the permit fees for this application, and Kennedy Jenks has approved the Class 3 mainline uh, design plans, so those are ready to be built. Um, I would rec recommend to your board that you approve the cl Class 3 permit application and the Class 1A permit application subject to the construction of the cl Class 3, uh, final approval of design plans, and uh, lost my train of thought. Construction of the line, final uh, design approval. Are you going to meet and with him during the next month anyway? Yeah. And Clear up any loose ends. That yeah. Oh, I and think. the payment of all applicable fees is the third. Are, but are there any more fees to be paid? 
Well, he's got to he's got to pay off the uh, portion of the non-contingent assessment, or the contingent assessment, I should say, the eighteen thousand total fee. Yeah, that's not listed here. That's what's listed here is what he has paid to date. Mm. So he will be purchasing a contingent assessment, and because he has a non-contingent assessment on his parcel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Whatever approval we may do, uh, I really want it conditioned on the uh, the one of two things: either the class one isn't issued until the main line is completed and the engineer yeah that was uh, a condition it, right? or there is some other guaranteed of the district like a performance bond or something okay such that uh, if necessary uh, we would be able to finish it without expense to okay. the district and and the reason i've been so hot on this for the last seven years is because um, uh, there is a local builder who basically went bankrupt because he bought a property and was assured that it had a main line and he went and built the house and went to connect it and mm. found out there was no main line there and, and uh, since then, I've been committed to never allowing that situation to occur again. All right. We should probably allow Mr. Fogley to speak now that you've given your, before we make any final motions. Or Would you like to? Or? Um, sure. I mean, basically, um, my name is Michael. The last name is spelled F-O-G-L-I. And um, this is a house for my daughter. And it's as simple as that. I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. Um, um, this has been a long time coming, as 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 your documentation probably uh, has on there. And I do agree with uh, you, Mr. Warren. Is that your last name? Yes. That uh, that in fact, I think those contingencies are fair and reasonable. You know, to have it built, to have the funds there, to just make sure it will get done. All right. And if you have any questions, I'm here to answer. W them. Would it be? Um, hardship for you at this point because um, I know that performance bonds cost money would it be a hardship for you to have uh, you know, it, uh, assuming the board approves the, the permits for the class one approval to be conditioned that it's not actually issued by staff until the uh, main line is completed um, as long as that's written out and spelled out, I really wouldn't have a problem with that because because one goes with the other, and uh, you need a main line to hook up a sewer, and and it seems logical to me that I would uh, to have that done. I have no problem with that. You know, well, there, as far as a performance bond, I've never gotten a performance bond. I don't know what they are, how they work, or anything like that. <laughs> so I mean, I couldn't tell you about a performance bond, but. To pay right. somebody to put in a sewer would probably be the way to do it, I would think. Well, the, the, the reason I asked if it would be a problem is, is it, it depends on the, the timing that you need because it will take a certain amount of time to do the main line and you wouldn't be able to get your permit from the county without the class one, which what I'm suggesting wouldn't be issued until the, the main line is done. That, that's that's where the problem potentially One of the out. other things, if that might be a actual problem, is I could get an estimate on how much it's going to be from Andrini or whoever does these things around here and maybe put that up in a secured bank account or something say, okay, here's the funds yeah, that's for the that. Same. That's the same. As it was yeah. like a and, so, right. and, so, and so the money's there. Now we can go with, and it's only good for that one thing. And so. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that, but that, council's that nodding. And if that's a performance bond, that's fine. Yeah. Oh, if that's what performance bond is. Well, yeah. Well, it's well, it's performance okay. bond, bond takes a lot of. Security deposit. Right. Yeah. Okay, a security deposit and the amount of what it's going to take to get the job done. No so, so the posting of, of some type of security uh, upon the approval of district council and general manager. So the, if you want me to reiterate my, my three condition payment of all applicable capacity and connection fees at all, construction of the class three mainline complete or securitization there, thereof, 
and approval of the final plans and specs. It's by the general manager. By the general manager. I only ask this because that obviously this has been strung out over a number of years. Um, suppose Mr. Fogley puts the money in a secured account and something happens. And uh, will we run the regular um, expiration date on the Class 3 permit? The Class 3 and the Class 1A. He's getting a permit and he's subject to all the rules of those permits thereof. Yeah. So if he doesn't start construction on the 1A, for instance, in two years, we'll send him a letter and give him back his money and he'll have to reapply uh, as if it were a new permit. Won't hang up his money. Right. No. So the account okay. you're talking about is, in a sense, an escrow account where right. if, if he completes it, then he gets the money back. If he doesn't and, right. and we're somehow forced to, to do it, then the money comes to us. Right. They could put it in an escrow account with the bank. We could hold it in our trust account, whatever is. Okay, yeah, as long as there's, there's already. Yeah, we've done this. Already before. outlined procedures for this. Well, what I would think is that amount of money, if I might, uh, would go to to the subcontractor who's going to be doing it, kind of thing. You know, if it costs X amount of dollars, then those same X dollars go to pay off the guy who's doing it, or. Well, I mean, we. Uh, I mean, it can be worked out. Yeah, I mean, unless they, they, you guys want to get into the details, we've done this yeah, before, yeah, so. Yeah, fine. Not necessary. Now, now, the way I read the map here, it looks like you only need to build about, I don't know, 20 to 40 feet of main line. Um, according to uh, Kennedy Jenks, I needed to build it to the far part of the, of the lot, if I'm not mistaken, according to their approved plans that I needed to take it all the way beyond to to the far point of the lot. I might mm. be wrong on that, but the approved plan to sign off then by them specify. So I think it goes beyond even. They're bringing it to the next corner. Bring it to right. the next corner. Okay, but in any case, corner. it's a fairly short distance. You're not running. Yeah, exactly. Maybe exactly. A whole block or something feet. like that. Yeah. yeah. I might suggest though that you give the general manager some <coughs> flexibility to determine the point that it should be built to. I mean, maybe this hasn't been looked at. For right. quite a while, and you may have a different approach than Kennedy Jenks did at, the, at that time. So, yeah. okay, that's fair. Can I make a clarification, um, Mr. General Manager, that we have a current so policy long. to take a four thousand dollar advance deposit on class three main lines for our the district expenses is the um, performance bond money in addition to yeah. To okay. All. Okay. Have you? Uh, let me start again. Has the staff uh, looked at that stretch to make sure there are no long laterals there? Because uh, I think it's the, uh, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, it's the, the very next block, uh, Alameda, you can actually see where the, the, the 200 foot lateral is on this map. And be, because some GSD board before me, allowed these long laterals, uh, you have to be careful uh, in areas that have no sewer mains uh, that there might in fact be some uh, unmarked long laterals there.